lifting up Jesus and opening his word from Australia, Denmark, Israel, Japan, New Zealand, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, Singapore, South Africa, United Kingdom, Thailand, the Philippines, the United States, and throughout the world. You're watching Morial TV. First of all, we have to understand what we mean by Christians. Not everyone who says they're a Christian is born again. Most of the persecution was fortunately done by people who were not born again. It was done by nominal Christians. More tragically, however, after the Reformation, beginning with Martin Luther, you had people who said they were born-again Christians or evangelical Christians or regenerate Christians who also engaged in it. But before Luther, there were really no major recorded instances of born-again Christians persecuting Jews. It was always the Roman Catholic Church or the Eastern Orthodox Church until the time of Luther. Luther in the 16th century began as friendly to the Jews initially, but when they would not support the Reformation and, and accept Christ, he became vehemently anti-Semitic. Martin Luther was in most respects a man who began right, but ended quite badly. During the peasants' revolt in Germany, he said the peasants should be stabbed in the back. He said and did some terrible things, but he also said, that every Jew should be hoarded into a corral and forced to confess Christ at the point of a knife, that the synagogue should be burned, and that the German people should murder the Jews to prove they are Christians. That's what he actually preached at the end of his life and wrote. Adolf Hitler quoted Luther extensively in his book Mein Kampf. Luther is the unfortunate exception. Luther definitely put evangelical Christians, or people who even said they were saved, on the course of anti-Semitism and Jew hatred. But before Luther, throughout all those centuries, it was not carried out by people who were saved. Saved Christians themselves during the Dark Ages and earlier were persecuted by the same people who persecuted the church. You had always, before the Reformation, there were born-again Christians in Britain and in Europe. In England, they were called the Lollards. They followed John Wycliffe. In Central Europe, they were called the Bohemian Brethren. They followed John Hus. Earlier than that, there were the people in Italy and France called Waldensians. In Spain and other places, you had groups called Albiginists. There were always born-again Christians for centuries, but they were persecuted the same way the Jews were by the same people who persecuted the Jews. It was not until Luther that people who said they were born again or said they were saved or regenerate or evangelical began to persecute Jews. Unfortunately, that has begun to change more even in the modern world, where seven out of nine evangelical bishops in Germany in the 1930s supported Hitler and the Holocaust, claiming to be Christian, saved Christian. Also today, there's a movement among people claiming to be born again, claiming to be evangelical, who are anti-Zionist. But when you lift up their anti-Zionism and look what's underneath it, it is simply traditional European anti-Semitism. The same as you have Christians in Europe today who are pro-Israel and see Israel fulfilling prophecy, there is a movement of Christians who are pro-Islamic, basically. They're sympathetic to Islam, even though Islam persecutes Christians, and these are very anti-Israel anti or anti-Zionist. Yet they claim to be born again. They claim to be saved. In the last days, the position of Christians concerning Israel will be one of the key issues, one of the key issues that will separate the true church from the harlot church. The position on Israel will be a key issue that will divide true believers from the apostate church that will follow the Antichrist. I have no doubt. Israel is sort of a litmus test, a barometer. If a Christian is right about Israel, 
If a Christian understands that God has a prophetic purpose for Israel and the Jews, that does not mean that all their other doctrines are right. There are people who are Christians who love Israel who have crazy ideas. Some of them are going back under the law. Some of them are trying to dress up like Jews and wear yarmulkes. Some of them are going into Jewish legalism like the Galatians. Being right about Israel does not prove a Christian is right about other things. However, being wrong about Israel proves they are wrong about other things. I have never found a single Christian author, theologian, or preacher who was anti-Israel, who was replacement theology, who were not fundamentally wrong in their other doctrines. One of Britain's most famous preachers died about a year ago. His name was John Stott, famous in Great Britain. John Stott was anti-Israel. He was completely replaced with theology. But John Stott was also highly ecumenical. John Stott believed in all kinds of things, including annihilationism. He taught people that we can't say that there's a hell and an eternal judgment. If somebody is wrong about Israel, I can guarantee they're going to be wrong in their other doctrine. Today, it's the same thing in the United States. You have people such as Bill Hybels and his wife, a major church in Chicago, based on marketing. He is, they are anti-Israel, part of Christ at the checkpoint, yet Bill Hybels had an Islamic imam, a Muslim imam in his church. After the September 11th attacks in New York, he had a Muslim explaining Islam to people who said they were born-again Christians. But he cannot find you a single mosque that will allow an evangelist to explain the gospel to Muslims. Again, Hybels is another example. When you find people who are opposed to Israel, I guarantee you they are also wrong in their other doctrine. I know of no exception. Israel is a litmus test. Being right about Israel doesn't mean they're always kosher or always right about other things. But if they're wrong about Israel, I can guarantee their other doctrine is fundamentally wrong. Another one is John Piper in America, a major Baptist. He's replaced in theology. John Piper is now endorsing Rick Warren's global peace plan. Rick Warren's global peace plan says we must unite with Buddhists, with Hindus, with Muslims, with people who worship other gods in order to bring in global peace. Now the New Testament teaches no Christ, no peace. There's only peace when Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Moses called other gods demons, Shedim in Hebrew. Paul the Apostle called other gods demons, the Manoi in Greek. Yet Rick Warren teaches we should unite with people who worship demons to bring in global peace. This is the Antichrist agenda, and it's supported by people like John Piper, replacement theology. If they are wrong about Israel, they are wrong in their other doctrine. In other words, the issue is not Israel. The issue is the way they interpret scripture is fundamentally wrong. They get it wrong about Israel because they get it wrong generally. They have a general error in the way they approach the word of God. This is the reality in Europe today and the reality in Britain today and the reality in the West generally, including America today. Yes, to understand the history of anti-Semitism and Jewish persecution in Great Britain, in the UK, which was mainly in England, we have to understand anti-Semitism in the context of medieval politics generally. In the scriptures, Jews were a nation of farmers and soldiers. Their life, their culture was built around faith, family, and farming, and they were all soldiers. The whole nation was a nation of soldiers, as is modern Israel today. When they were driven from their land under the judgment of God, according to the curses of the Torah in Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy 28, they were sent into the diaspora to be regathered in the last days. But once they lost their land and came into Europe, if a Jew had a farm, 
His barn would be burned. His land would be confiscated in a pogrom. <laughs> Jews couldn't be farmers anymore. That's how they always made their living. They were forced into certain professions and certain livelihoods by anti-Semitism. They were forced to be merchants because they couldn't have lands. In the Middle Ages, medicine was seen as a low degrading profession because it involved handling blood. Who do we get to do a bloody job? Get a bloody Jew. They forced Jews into the medical profession. In those days, it, the medical profession, of course, was not scientific. It was barbers letting blood out of people and things like this. But that's essentially the way that they did it. Jews were forced into medicine. Jews were always being accused falsely of ridiculous things, such as using the blood of Christian babies to make Passover matzah. And they were all these charges. They were forced into law to defend themselves because nobody else would defend them legally. They were forced into law and medicine by anti-Semitism. They were forced into merchant trades. But what happened in England and in parts of Europe, above all, was usury. The kings and nobility of medieval Britain and Europe used the Jews to carry out money lending for interest in order to reap taxation. They used the Jews as their tax collectors. They needed banking. They couldn't survive without it. But because of prohibitions against charging interest in usury, Catholics, Christians couldn't do it. Once again, who do we get for this dirty business? Get a dirty Jew. That's how they looked at it. Jews were forced to become moneylenders by the nobility and the royalty of Britain and, and Europe. The proceeds would be very, very heavily taxed by the monarchies and the nobility. They had no choice in it. But this caused the resentment of the Jews. They were fingered as, you're the merchants, you're the, uh, the moneylenders, you're the evil people. When in fact, they were forced into these things. They had no choice in order to survive but to do it. Well, the first pogrom that resulted from this was in the city of Norwich in England in the year 1060. That was the first major pogrom that happened in Britain, in England. In 1090, uh, sorry, 1190, a far worse one happened in the city of York at Cliff's Tower, where the Jews were essentially forced into a tower. It was set alight and they were murdered. Again, it was these anti-usury riots or anti-money lending riots, but they were forced to do it. A hundred years later, in 1290, under King Edward I, he was in deep financial straits, and he didn't see the taxation of Jews from the money lending as a high enough source of income. He needed the money all at once, so he expelled the Jews from England and took all of their wealth, any property, anything they owned, he simply took it. It was, again, financially motivated. That was in 1290. The Jews were not allowed to come back to England until the time of Cromwell. Oliver Cromwell um, was somebody who allowed the Jews to come back because he saw through the scriptures, it was pointed out to him, that the Jews would have to return to Israel from every nation, and he didn't want England to be left out. He also had certain financial and political interests to allow them to come into England from Europe. So until Cromwell, there were no Jews in England, and then Jews were allowed to remain in this country again. Anti-Semitism since that time has ebbed and flowed, but it never reached the levels it became in the Middle Ages. It never became that serious again until modern times. With the growth of Islamic immigration into Europe. You have a major problem in cities like Paris, cities like Rotterdam, cities like London, Birmingham particularly, where the anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism of radical Muslims is affecting the general social fabric. 
it's a strange situation. The bias you see today is masquerading as anti-Zionism, that is against Israel. Let's look at the realities. Look at the Middle East, look at the Muslim world generally. We are told by the left-wing media and by left-wing academics that it is America's support or Christian support for Israel that is fueling radical Islam. If Israel did not exist, if there was no such place as Israel, if it didn't exist, you would still have 3.4 million Christians murdered in Sudan by radical Islam and in Darfur. If Israel didn't exist, you would still have over 300,000 Christians murdered in East Timor by radical Islam. If Israel didn't exist, you would still have 90,000 dead Christians in the southern Philippines murdered by Abu Sayyaf, radical Islam. You would still have 1.3 million dead Christians murdered by radical Islam in northern Nigeria if there was no Israel. If you look at the countries of the Middle East, Iran has martyred 98% of its evangelical pastors. 98%. They hang them. There's a pastor in prison now. Yet Stephen Sizer, an anti-Israel activist who calls himself born again in England, he had no problem going to Iran while they were hanging Christians, while they were persecuting and hanging Christians. He went there at the invitation of the Iranian government of Ahmadinejad, shook hands, smiled, embraced them, appeared on TV with Ayatollah Khomeini's daughter, and denounced Israel. You can kill all the Christians you want. You can murder all the born-again Christians you want as long as you hate Israel. You're a friend and a brother of Stephen Sizer, who is a partner of John Stott. This is the reality. What happens to Christians in Saudi Arabia? The Saudi Arabian Wahhab, who are radical Islamists, radical Islamists, fund the construction of mosques and Islamic institutions all over the world, all over Britain, all over Europe, all over America, and all over Asia, and all over Africa. They are funding it. Because of the politics of oil, they're allowed to get away with it. Western governments will turn the other way, even when they're funding radicalism. And, and sponsoring support for what amounts to terror because their god is money, mammon worship. Saudi Arabians can finance the construction of all kinds of Islamic institutions and mosques, even radicalism. But you cannot build one church in Saudi Arabia. What happened to the Christians in southern Lebanon? They were driven out by Hezbollah. Who took the Christian refugees, the phalanges, from Lebanon? Israel. The Jews took the Christian refugees from Lebanon when they were driven out of their homes where they lived for centuries by the Muslims. What happens to Christians in any of these Islamic countries? What's happening to the Coptic Christians in Egypt as we speak? There's only one country in the Middle East, only one, that protects the human rights and religious freedom of Christians. That's Israel. Yet that's the one the hypocrites in the Church of Scotland, who are Presbyterian, and Stephen Sizer, and a lot of other evangelicals like Bill Hybels and his wife, and Tony Campolo and others, they're the ones everybody wants to get. What do we do about this terrible persecution of Christians in the Middle East? Oh, we'll find the one country that treats them decently and gives them their rights, and we'll single them out, and we'll try to turn the world against them and boycott them. It's, it's ridiculous. I could say the same about women's rights. What happens to women under Sharia, under Islamic law? Go on the women's rights or the human rights website and see what happens. There is one country in the Middle East where women have equal rights under the law with men. That's Israel. What are we going to do about these abuses of human rights of women in, in the Middle East and in these countries? Oh, we'll find the one country in the Middle East where women have equal rights and where women are protected and will boycott them. This is what academics and universities are saying. Well, I'm not a homosexual. As a Christian, I don't agree with homosexuality. I believe it to be wrong. But what happens to homosexuals under Sharia, under Islamic law? 
What are we going to do about the fate and the plight of homosexuals in the Middle East? Oh, we'll find the one country in the Middle East that tolerates homosexuals, Israel, and we'll single them out to be boycotted. And <laughs> Why are these hypocrites not boycotting Saudi oil? It's all about money, politics, lies, hypocrisy, and under that, anti-Semitism. What they're doing is not even logical. And there are people who say they are born again, including Lynn Hybels, including Tony Campola, including Steven Sizer, and including the late John Stott, who are at the center of it. It is complete hypocrisy. If you look at these people, and you debate them, and I debated one of them, I debated Alex Awad from Bethlehem Bible College on TV here in England. Whenever you point to the scriptures, they cannot answer doctrinally or theologically from the word of God. They simply begin making an impassioned political speech. They can't respond to the scripture, so they make a political speech. And they begin talking about vague principles such as brotherhood and justice. Where is the justice for Christians in the Gaza Strip? The first thing that happened when Hamas took over the Gaza Strip was they closed down the Christian bookshops. Where is the justice for Christians anywhere in the Muslim Arab world? It's all hypocrisy. They turn it into a political debate because they have no theological debate. Except that their political debate is flawed also. Jesus, Jesus, three times, without even looking to the book of Revelation, three times speaking in the first person, Jesus made it very clear, the Jews must return to Israel and return to Jerusalem. He said this in Luke 21, 24. Jerusalem will be trampled under the feet of the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles is completed. He uses two Greek words, katharon and etnon. A time of the Gentiles would end and the Jews would have to return to Jerusalem in order for him to return. In Matthew chapter 23, verse 39, when he's weeping over Jerusalem, he does the same thing in his prelude to what theologians call the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24. He tells Jerusalem, You will not see me until you say, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's the second time Jesus said the Jews must be back in Jerusalem and in their land Israel. In Zechariah chapter 12, in the Old Testament, before he was even born, Jesus was speaking through the Holy Spirit, and Zechariah writes down what he said. The burden of the Lord concerning Israel, concerning Jerusalem. They will look upon me who they have pierced, and mourn as one mourns for an only son. Even without going to the book of Revelation, three times Jesus himself said the Jews must be back in that land and in that capital in order for him to return. It is Satan who was trying to prevent the return of Christ because when Christ returns, Satan's kingdom falls. So Satan is trying to use politicians like Barack Obama and George Bush who are in bed with the Saudi Arabians. He's trying to use the European Union. He's trying to use the United Nations. He's trying to use the Arab League. He's trying to use anything he can to get the Jews out of that land and especially out of that city because he does not want Jesus to come back. He wants to prove the scriptures false. Unfortunately, Satan has some people major Christian leaders who claim to be born again, who are on his payroll, they're working for him. These so-called Christian anti-Zionists and the people who are pushing replacement theology, when you challenge them on the basis of the scripture, they cannot argue doctrinally or theologically. They either spiritualize the text or they ignore it, but they cannot debate it. The facts are against them. This is their problem. Our problem is, so many Christians naively believe them. When people don't know their scripture, they're going to listen to false teachers who are going to teach them false things. At any time in history, when you saw believers who really understood the word of God, you did not have replacement theology. 
Here in England, John and Charles Wesley, the great revivals of the Methodists, when real British evangelicism was born, they both believed God had a prophetic purpose for Israel and the Jews. So did Charles Spurgeon, probably the greatest Bible expositor the Baptists have ever had. He, here in Britain, in London, he believed the Jews would have to return to Israel. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones believed God had a prophetic purpose for Israel and the Jews. J.C. Ryle, the first Anglican bishop of Liverpool and a truly great Anglican evangelical, believed that God had a prophetic purpose for Israel and the Jews. The Puritans even believed it. The fact that it's not believed is a symptom of the decline of Christianity. Evangelicism in Britain and in much of the Western world is in a state of spiritual, theological, moral, and numerical decline. The attitude and the changing attitude of Christians towards Israel is a symptom, is evidence of that decline. When you had a strong, vibrant church, Christians tended to understand God's purpose for Israel and the Jews. Again, it's a litmus test. First of all, the spirit of the age, the zeitgeist, as a theologian would call it, the spirit of the age, has infiltrated, permeated the church. People are thinking with the mind of the world instead of the mind of Christ. They are not looking at the scriptures scripturally. They're looking at the scriptures in light of the popular culture and trends of the day. The popular culture and trends of the day, as orchestrated by the media, politicians, and academic institutions, are going increasingly in an anti-Israel direction. This mentality gets into the church. And when you have Christians and pastors who are biblically ignorant, or who are teaching error, this predisposes the church to that kind of thinking. The source of the problem, however, is not a, a modern one. It goes back to the church fathers. Biblical Christianity, the original gospel of Jesus, was a faith that came out of Old Testament Judaism. It was a faith that saw Jesus as the Messiah and the fulfillment of the Torah, the law. That's what it was. As the church demographically became more Gentile, it began to change culturally. That was not the problem. The problem is, as it changed culturally, it began to change spiritually and theologically. While Christianity began in Israel as a faith, in Greece and in Rome, with the church fathers, the patristic writers, it went from being a faith to a philosophy based on Plato. Eventually, it goes from Greece to Rome where it becomes a political empire. Then it comes to America, where it becomes a corporation. And then, of course, in Korea, you imitate the West. Because the gospel was brought to Korea by missionaries from Scotland, Presbyterians, and from the United States, the baggage of the West comes with it. Where East met West, the Levant, the Middle East, is where three continents came together. Europe, the West, Asia, the East, and Africa, the South, they converge in the Middle East, in the Eastern Mediterranean. Israel is at the center of the center. It's at the center of the Middle East. God put the Jews there so when the Messiah came, the gospel would spread to all cultures and in all directions. It's not just a Western faith or an Eastern faith. I accept the fact that there's cultural differences between African Christians, Western Christians, and Asian Christians. The book of Acts chapter 15 and 1 Corinthians chapter 7 allows for cultural differences. Cultural differences are fine, but there should be no theological, doctrinal, or spiritual differences. None. We need to go back to the original faith of the New Testament, which was Jewish and is Jewish theologically and spiritually. Validity, the validity of a covenant, never depends on the unfaithfulness or infidelity of man. A covenant only depends on the faithfulness of God. We're told in the New Testament, 
He remains faithful even when we are unfaithful, for he cannot deny himself. If God is finished with the Jews, he is automatically finished with the church, because the church has no covenant. Christians need to understand this. The new covenant was made with the Jews. That's what it says in the Old Testament and in the New. Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31. I will make, literally, I will cut a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. The new covenant, Jeremiah predicts, or God says through Jeremiah, would be made not with the Baptists or the Pentecostals or the Presbyterians or the Pope. The new covenant... God told Jeremiah would be made with Israel and the Jews. In Romans chapter 9, St. Paul, Paul the Apostle, confirms this. He says, to the Jews belongs, still belongs. In Greek, it's present continuous active. Belongs the diathike, not covenant, covenants. Both covenants, the old and the new, still presently belong to Israel and the Jews according to the New Testament and according to the Old Testament. If God is finished with the Jews, he's automatically finished with the church because the church has no covenant. While it is true that Korean people who accept Jesus and are born again replace Jews who reject him, the church never replaces Israel. Jews are the natural branches. And if they repent, they'll be grafted in again. And if so-called Christians stop believing and make the same mistake as the Jews, they'll be cut off, we're told in Romans 11. And that's exactly what is happening. The time of the Gentiles is coming to an end. Think of the olive tree that Paul describes. When you see a tree growing in the ground, you can't see its roots. The Greek word is riza. You can't see the root, but you know two things. You know it has a root, and you know the root is alive. Because if it didn't have a root, or if the root was dead, the tree would be dead. If God is finished with the Jews, the church is dead. Because the root is the covenant that God made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's the root. That's the riza. If he's finished with the Jews, he's finished with the church. The church has no covenant of its own. Jesus inaugurated the new covenant. The new covenant was made at a Jewish Passover Seder, at a Paschal meal. That's when Jesus inaugurated the terms of the new covenant at the Last Supper. He said, This is the cup of the cup of the new covenant in my blood. The new covenant of his blood. The New Testament tells us that the new covenant itself, the gospel itself, was inaugurated at a Jewish Passover Seder. Jeremiah said a covenant would be made with the Jews, and it was. And St. Paul tells us to the Jews belongs the covenants. Replacement theology is not just false. It is a lie. And it's not just a lie, it is a stupid lie. People who believe this nonsense are either ignorant or bigoted or both. They're fundamentally misreading the scripture, either out of ignorance or out of rebellion. You cannot believe what the New Testament actually says and believe in such nonsense as replacement theology or anti-Zionism.